This is it. We've made it. A brand new console generation. Congratulations to everyone who braved the pre-order chaos, but for anyone patiently biding their time and saving their pennies, take comfort in knowing the last generation isn't over yet. Yes, the lines between console generations are more blurred than ever. Gone are the days where you'd be stuck with whatever came out on launch day, which as some of us know can vary wildly in quality. I have made a creature to rule over mankind. Backwards compatibility has been a strong focus of both the PS5 and Xbox Series X, leading to plenty of generational crossover. Add Nintendo into the mix, who've been doing their own thing on their own schedule for years now, and of course the evergreen PC market, and the restrictive idea of console generations might seem laughable, but it does make for a nice neat way of categorising an entire era of video game history, and making a fun video about it. While it's tempting to list off a tour de force of the very best games of the last seven or eight years, that's not the sole aim here. We're looking at those that made the most impact, shaped the landscape, and influenced the industry we know today. That could be through unique gameplay innovations, incredible stories, technological advancements, shaking up existing genres, spawning copycat business models, single-handedly forming a complete cultural zeitgeist. Or, you know, just by simply being a great game. Thankfully, there's plenty of those coming up. We're not sticking solely to console titles either, and we'll also specify that these entries are in no particular order, because it's nearly impossible to state one is better than another, and would rather keep the furious comment section warfare to our long form ranked lists. Okay, let's rank. Uh, not. Let's not rank them. I'm Ben. And I'm Peter from Triple Jump, and here are the 20 video games that defined this generation. Undertale One day, YouTube channels and the internet as a whole might stop banging on about how great Undertale is, but today is not that day! If there's any title that epitomises the charm and ingenuity of the indie scene this generation, it's Undertale. Sure, retro art style is right up there with jaunty chip tunes and roguelike elements on the indie game bingo sheet, Holy yeah. it. but this commonly used dose of 16-bit nostalgia had a deceptively deep message. The characters might be 2D sprites, but they're fully three-dimensional, fleshed out and superbly written, able to convey both whimsical absurdity and heartbreaking sorrow. The blend of RPG and bullet hell gameplay was a unique take that also served to reinforce the message of the game. Not all monsters are monsters, you know? But the true genius shined on multiple playthroughs, with the game remembering your past actions, especially if they were a bit, let's say, mass murdery, and some endings were only accessible by deleting all your cached data and starting truly from scratch. But you'll always know what you did, and you can't hide from the past forever. Overwatch. In 2016, after years of dominance from copy and paste military shooters, Blizzard swaggered cockily onto the scene and, despite no prior experience in the shooty bang bang genre, ended up changing it forever. Overwatch was born from the cancelled MMO Titan in 2013, when a small team were inspired to create a hero based shooter with as much personality as Team Fortress 2. Safe to say, they smashed it with a staggering variety of colourful characters that extended into wildly differing playstyles. Forget about incremental stat changes on bland weaponry, you could freeze enemies, fire ghostly dragon arrows, turn into an actual tank, and resurrect your whole team. Well, until you got nerfed into oblivion, but still, this diversity, combined with a strong emphasis on balanced team play, meant no two matches ever felt the same. This made for a great spectator sport too. Not content with more than 40 million players, the game helped push the already growing esports industry in new directions, drawing in hundreds of thousands of viewers. Tracer even cameoed in 2018's movie adaptation of Ready Player One, though thankfully there was no speaking role. Cheers, love! The cavalry's here! Hello, hello, hello! And yes, Overwatch may have had a hand in normalising loot boxes. Doesn't matter how good the game is, Blizzard, we're not going to let you get away with that one, alright? Red Dead Redemption 2 You ever watch a classic western and think, yeah, 
Gunslinging's cool, but how exactly does Clint Eastwood achieve such finely trimmed facial fuzz in 1800s frontier America? In 2018, we had our answer with Red Dead Redemption 2, a technical marvel that blended exhilarating shootouts of ye olde west with the mundane necessities of shaving, bathing, and grazing on grilled rabbit. This ambitious approach from Rockstar combined video game power fantasy with realistic immersion that had no right to work as well as it did, and yet, everything served to ground you in this gorgeously rendered Wild West. For every manic jailbreak, there was a tranquil fishing trip. One minute you're going down lawmen on horseback, the next you're pampering the horse with his own personal spa treatment. Who's a pretty boy, Comrade Trotsky? That's right. It's me. There was also the usual rock star flair on show, an epic saga carrying poignant themes of change and loss, a rogues gallery of engaging characters, hilariously bizarre side encounters, and of course, a playground to cause as much chaos as humanly possible. The huge scale and often slower tempo wasn't for everyone, but Red Dead's straight-up refusal to leave anything out of the experience pushed the boundaries of immersion. Besides, life isn't always about barroom brawls and train robberies, you know? Dota 2 even if PC gaming doesn't subscribe to the silly notions of console generations, they still influenced the industry massively. Case in point, 2013's Dota 2. Yes, technically it came out a few months before the console generation started, but that doesn't matter, literally millions have played this game. The original Defense of the Ancients mod for Warcraft 3 helped birth the MOBA genre, and its sequel brought the genre to the masses with the help of its long-running rival, 2009's League of Legends. So how does Dota work? Well, it's simple. To win, your team of five heroes must level up, destroy the enemy team's nine defensive towers, and finally, they're ancient. Easy. See? There definitely aren't over 100 heroes to choose from, even more equipable items, countless team compositions all built upon layers and layers of ever-changing meta. <laughs> okay, you got us. Dota isn't simple. This staggering depth is what simultaneously scares new players off and draws them in. And once you're hooked, that's it. The clutch turnaround win, the perfectly executed trouncing, the 10-game losing streak, it doesn't matter you'll always be back for more. It's also left a mark on eSports, with 2020's Dota International Tournament boasting the biggest prize pool in eSports history, and the game drawing the third largest viewership for any event behind Fortnite and League of Legends. Put simply, Dota is an institution. What remains of Edith Finch? While some players adore thousands of hours of replay value, others simply don't have the time. Thankfully, this generation saw an explosion of shorter, typically story-focused titles. Games like Gone Home, Firewatch, and Everybody's Gone to the Rapture are fine examples of the genre known as walking simulators, where narrative takes precedence over complicated gameplay. And for many, Giant Sparrow's What Remains of Edith Finch, released in 2017, was absolute best in show. The tale follows a family cursed by misfortune, spanning across generations, but that basic description might be as ridiculous productive as calling any game a simulation of walking. All right? <laughs> we stop it. The experience is weird, mystical, and almost otherworldly, but consistently twinged with melancholy. The presentation is impeccable, presenting words from the pages of Edith Finch's diary as you explore the memories strewn around this manner of impossible proportions. It's the strangest, most emotional virtual museum tour you'll ever see, bringing half a dozen different styles to the table as you go back through the family tree. And then it ends, leaving you in a whirling state of introspection. Did it really happen? Am I getting the most out of the fleeting life I have? Can I really fly if I go all the way round on a park swing? Yes, is the no, it's don't do that. Edith Finch proved the power of interactive storytelling, and we feel like walking simulators have only just begun to stretch their legs. Resident Evil 2 Remake OK, before we get too carried away with deep, introspective narratives, let's not forget the true video game art form, zombie giblet painting. Oh yeah, classic. Speaking of classics, the last few years have been a renaissance of nostalgic remakes. There are so many worthy contenders, but the 2019 remake of Resident Evil 2 marked a new high point, one of the best reimaginings of a classic game we've seen to date. At least, the best completed one. It 
was the perfect match of old and new, blending sweet nostalgia with modern innovation. There was the switch to a proper over-the-shoulder third-person view, which far from losing the suspense of the PS1 era fixed camera angles, made things much, much worse in the best possible way. I cannot cope with this immersion. Then there were the changes to the enemies, items and puzzles, sometimes subtle, sometimes drastic, bringing new challenges and jump scares to even veteran zombie slayers, and leaving you to question your memory and sanity. And who could forget the relentless new Mr. X, or Mr. Cross if you want to get official names for the PlayStation buttons about this. It might seem like cheating to call a PS1 remake a defining title for this generation, but there's no denying that this became a real benchmark mark for all future remakes to strive for. It's why the Resi 3 remake didn't go down as well. Fortnite I don't know, uh, th the kids seem to like it. Um, next entry, I guess. What? Oh no, you can't make me talk about it, please! Oh, okay, fine. Jokes aside, you cannot deny that Fortnite has been one of, if not the most culturally significant game of the generation. It's become more than just a video game, it's a worldwide sensation. It's launched hundreds of copycat TikTok dancers, hosted live music concerts in-game, teamed with the biggest movie releases, and it even got its claws into international football, for goodness sake, with half the England squad bonding over countless games during that fateful summer of 2018. Its success helped Epic Games challenge the established dominance of Steam and more recently take on Apple in a legal dispute over distribution fees, basically the equivalent of two gazillionaires fighting over pocket change, which also incidentally gave us a terrifying glimpse into how insidious propaganda films can weaponize a 250 million strong fan base into backing one gazillionaire company over another. Wow, not bad for a game that started out as an unremarkable zombie survival with building elements that then nicked the battle royale shtick from PUBG, eh? So there we go, is that enough fair praise? N no, I'm not doing any of the dances. That's it, we're moving on! The VR Revolution, Beat Saber, Half-Life Alex, and more. Now, technically, this is about the technology as a whole, rather than any one game, so I guess you could call this one the wildcard entry that defined the generation. Virtual reality has been held up as the golden goose of gaming for decades. Sega first gave it a real go in 1994 with this Star Trek looking beast, but could only manage it in arcades. Then the Virtual Boy happened, and our retinas needed 15 years to recover before 2010 when Oculus Rift developed their first prototype. Then, Facebook purchased Oculus for a whopping $2 billion and the VR floodgates opened. But has it really fulfilled its potential for immersion? Well, not really. <laughs> VR has made huge strides in the last decade, but it's been a very bumpy road. A bumpy road that gave us crippling car sickness. The ingenious co-op bomb defusal title, Keep Talking and Nobody Explodes, was an early success story, as was VR mode in Elite Dangerous, but those games existed outside of virtual reality as well. The fact that Skyrim, LA Noire, and even Minecraft translated their ambitious open worlds into VR was impressive, but awkward controls took you out of the experience rather than immersing you further. Realistically, it's been the smaller, more contained titles leading the way, ones built with VR in mind. One of the best can be found in the simple arcade pleasures of 2018's Beat Saber, the rhythm game likened to Guitar Hero with lightsabers. Then in 2020, we got Half-Life Alex, not only a new Half-Life game, a marvel in itself, but a wonderful beacon of what VR can still achieve. This tense, half-shooter, half-horror experience Experience matched intuitive gameplay with AAA presentation, showcasing just how far we've come in 10 years and how far we could still go. Animal Crossing New Horizons 
During our meticulous research for this video, we'd made a note next to Animal Crossing that said it was there for us when we needed it the most. And hyperbole aside, it is kind of true. You might have noticed already, but 2020 has been a tough old year. In March, when it seemed most of the world was either under lockdown or out there fighting the pandemic as a key worker, one game above all helped us get away from all the bad stuff and lose ourselves in a delightful paradise island filled with cutesy, anthropomorphic animal friends. For a couple of hours a day, we could worry about turnip prices instead of furlough wages, focus on making quaint decorations instead of making ends meet. We couldn't see most of our friends and family in the real world, but at least we could see them on their islands, have a chat, dig for fossils, and admire their flower gardens or, um, illegal backyard wrestling ring. New Horizons didn't change a whole lot from the typical Animal Crossing formula, but it helped so many of us during a time of worldwide change. When historians look back on this hot mess of a year, we are sure the impact of this twee virtual island will at least make it into the footnotes of history. Destiny it turns out that being a good game and being good for gaming as an industry are very much not the same. Before 2014, we'd never think to make that distinction, but Destiny, well, Destiny changed everything. There's no denying that at its core, Destiny is a good game. Mechanically speaking, it's some of the best buttery smooth shooting action you'll ever experience. Exactly what you'd expect from Halo veterans Bungie. Exploring gorgeous planets, gunning down a host of unique alien foes, and hoovering up their delicious engrams was so satisfying you could lose countless weekends to the Destiny flow. But Activision used this exciting MMO shooter hybrid to create something much more sinister, the live service game. It went on to influence many a soulless copycat, cynically aimed at draining players of their time and money, from Fallout 76 to Anthem to Marvel's Avengers. Admittedly, Destiny itself wasn't the worst culprit. Microtransactions were cosmetic only, and there was no subscription model as such. But the mishandling of DLCs, season passes, and eventually a sequel that didn't carry over the years of progress some players had made from the first game, collectively left a very very sour taste in the mouth. Destiny is a complicated case, a critical and commercial success and pretty damn fun when taken in isolation, but complicit in a worrying industry trend. It has certainly left its mark, for better or worse. And speaking of worse, it's time for a brief interlude to honour the not-so-great contributions from this generation. May we forever learn from their mistakes and take notes for future Worst Games Ever material. For ruining a beloved classic franchise, soiling it with awful gambling mechanics and pay-to-win nonsense, Star Wars Battlefront 2. For desecrating an iconic series that shaped many a childhood with a lazy cash-in, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 5! For besmirching one of the greatest sci-fi RPGs of all time, turning it into glitchy nightmare fuel, Mass Effect Andromeda. Really? Commander? For violating a... Okay, you get the idea. It's Fallout 76! All of this just works. For revealing the fantastic horror demo, P.T., then cancelling the planned game and releasing Kojima into the wild, where he was allowed to make piss mushroom delivery games sponsored by Monster Energy Drink, <gasps> Konami with Silent Hills. And the winner is... Uh, none of them. Nobody's a winner here. Let's get back to talking about good games that had no controversy or rough patches, shall we? Final Fantasy XIV. This MMO started life in a blaze of controversy and rough patches. Oh, for goodness sake. Technically, the first Final Fantasy XIV came out in 2010, firmly outside the realms of this generation, but it was such a mess of stability issues, poor design, and rubbish story that Square Enix scrapped the whole thing and brought in producer Naoki Yoshida to head up a complete overhaul. Rebuilding from the ground up was an unprecedented move, but it paid off big time. 
A Realm Reborn released in August 2013. For the PS3 first, but its consistent, high-quality patches more than earn it a top place in this gen. And for once in video game titles, the Reborn label was fully justified. A new game engine provided more stability, the battle system was improved massively, and the superb story became the biggest draw for a genre that so often suffers from plotline pitfalls. They even incorporated the old world into the backstory of this new one. A nice touch there. And thanks to this rich storyline and abundant lore, even the leveling process is a joy, unlike so many other MMOs where the real game seemingly begins at the end game. Final Fantasy XIV was the definitive poster child in how to make a amends to your fans, dedicating years to crafting something better, and the constant care it receives to this day, the latest expansion coming in 2019, shows real commitment to quality. God of War. Get in the boat, boy. 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 Look at me, boy. 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 We're gonna go out on a limb and say this is the single greatest video game about parenting in a mythological Norse setting we've ever encountered. Remember what I told you about expectations, boy. The 2018 reboot of God of War was the golden example in how to reinvent a franchise. It steered a notoriously bloodthirsty hack and slash in a completely new direction while staying true to the essence of the series. It also took one of the most morally questionable protagonists in gaming history and made him relatable somehow. We actually cared about Kratos, an unthinkable notion in his rebellious youth, and in a story packed with powerful gods and spectacular set pieces, it's the fractured relationship with his son Atreus that stuck with us. This connection grew throughout the game, with Kratos gradually going from barely acknowledging the boy to eventually giving out faint praise and even laughing at a joke. Wow. Or I guess an underwater wheel. Did you just laugh at that? No. You sure? Yes. I do not laugh. All right, maybe not, but it still counts as personal development. It also helped that Atreus was an integral part of the gameplay too, and what stellar gameplay that was. Combat felt weightier and more tactical, but just as visceral as God of War should be, while the puzzles were immensely satisfying and cleverly arranged. And the one-take camera angle approach was inspired, making every moment feel cinematic, yet never taking us out of the action with an abrupt loading screen or cutscene. Somehow, they made a third-person perspective feel more immersive than many first-person titles. Whether future games take note of this approach, we don't know, but the artistic, narrative, and gameplay brilliance of God of War places it as one of the defining video games of the last generation. Pokemon Go. We said earlier we'd look beyond console games, and you can't get much further than this. In the summer of 2016, Pokemon Go captured the hearts and minds of millions. Niantic's ingenious GPS system had Pokemon pop up at random locations, leading hordes of wannabe trainers, many of them fully grown adults, on a quest around their local areas to catch the coolest, cutest, and rarest pocket monsters. In one fell swoop, this wonderful little augmented reality game shattered decades of lonely gamer stereotypes as you'd make friends with strangers during a big raid or bump into an old acquaintance while chasing chasing a Charmander in the park. It wasn't just a video game about flinging Pokeballs at virtual animals, it was a social phenomenon. This was your own, real-life Pokemon adventure that so many of us had dreamed of as children, and it proved that you're never too old to cycle hurriedly to the other end of town because your mate said he'd seen a rare Jigglypuff. It was such a force of nature, it even made its way into the US presidential debate, with Hillary Clinton famously proving how hip and with it she was by urging citizens to Pokemon go to the polls. Oh god. Maybe calling it the most politically influential video game of all time is a bit of a stretch, but it did let us catch a scyther while walking to work, and that's pretty cool. No Man's Sky. A certain rather successful game designer once said, a delayed game is eventually good, but a rushed game is forever bad. That wisdom has been held as gospel for years, but not anymore! Post-launch patches and hot-fix culture has encouraged some pretty bad habits, but it's also created some good. No game was more ambitious, more overhyped, and more soul-crushingly disappointing at launch than No Man's Sky. It literally promised the universe, a procedurally generated collection of 18 quintillion planets filled with limitless potential, yet 
When this space-based sandbox released in 2016 to middling reviews, Hello Games founder Sean Murray went from hero to villain overnight. Murray has since admitted he was naive, caught up in Peter Molyneux levels of excitability about the possibilities while ignoring the limitations. But rather than cut their losses, Murray and the team doubled down on the dream, and through years of hard graft they gradually turned No Man's Sky into a genuinely great game. It's not the holy grail that was promised, but the turnaround is incredibly impressive, adding base building, storyline improvements, cross-platform multiplayer, diverse flora and fauna, and tons of smaller improvements. No Man's Sky was this generation's cautionary tale against hype, but it also became an inspirational story in how to deliver on your promises, even when you deal yourself a terrible starting hand. Bloodborne Let's be blunt, Bloodborne is terrifying, it's difficult, it's heartbreaking, it's confusing. In a nutshell, it's brilliant. In 2015, From Software took the formula for their popular Souls series and twisted it into this beautifully malformed, gorgeously grotesque masterpiece, and in the process made one of the greatest action games of all time. If our description so far sounds conflicted, that's the point. Bloodborne is all about contradictions. The world of Yharnam feels relentlessly foreboding and bleak, yet the stunning gothic architecture holds a mystical beauty. It feels claustrophobic, yet it reveals new paths all the time. You'll have no idea what's going on, right up until the lore hits you in the face. You'll struggle against the difficulty, even if you're a veteran Souls player, yet you'll feel compelled to push on and learn the intricacies of this faster, more aggressive combat. Each new area hides a horrific eldritch monster just waiting to tear you a new orifice, yet you can't wait to find them, beat them, and conquer your fears. The atmosphere, the challenge, the world building, the art direction, everything in Bloodborne is exquisitely balanced to create a uniquely engrossing experience. If the Souls games were the heavily armoured shield bearer, slowly and cautiously creeping into our hearts, Bloodborne was the swift, graceful assault on the senses that we'll never forget. Rocket League. Sometimes your game doesn't need to start lawsuits, create new genres, or get kids to go outdoors. Sometimes it can just be a really fun game. That's Rocket League in a nutshell, an inventive concept that can be instantly conveyed to new players. It's football, but with remote control cars, and it's a dangerously good time. Psyonix launched this pseudo sports title in 2015, improving on their 2008 debut, Supersonic Acrobatic Rocket Powered Battle. Cars. They used a shorter name for starters, but they also perfected the physics engine which was key for the oversized ball to react realistically to having cars flung at it. We're still in the test phase for the Peter Austin DLC though. It's easy enough to pick up and play immediately, but with a sky-high skill ceiling, this was the ultimate arcade experience. Nothing compared to the sweet satisfaction of nailing a spectacular aerial goal. So we've heard, we wouldn't actually know. Damn lack of skill. Throw in a wealth of vehicle customization, smooth cross-platform multiplayer, ranked leagues, and new game modes that put their own spin on basketball, hockey, and a... Uh, ball punching, and you've got a 40 million player strong hit on your hands. Five Nights at Freddy's in 2014, indie developer Scott Cawthorn released Five Nights at Freddy's, and with it, accidentally started a cult. This simple yet devilishly clever horror title tasked you with a night guard duty at a creepy children's restaurant called Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. Flicking through security camera feeds and controlling the safety doors to your offices when necessary. Which is silly, because they're, they're just puppets, right? There's no way they can move on their own. Oh! Yeah. Christ, it's on a pogo stick! The accessible gameplay, along with a plethora of jump scares, made this ripe for YouTube playthroughs, being featured by the likes of PewDiePie, Markiplier, and other famous purveyors of loudly screaming into the face cam. From here, the series skyrocketed. In just two years, the creator produced four mainline titles, albeit with near-identical gameplay, and as of 2020, there have been 11 games total, including spin-offs, eight novels, a long-delayed movie, a theme park attraction, official merchandise, countless fan arts, 
And of course, there's the background lore, that's been expanded and milked to death with countless theory videos cashing in on this internet sensation. Like Minecraft and Slenderman in generations past, FNAF represented the viral power of social media, a godsend for smaller indie games that would have been lost in the crowd otherwise. Games like Goat Sim, Roblox, Octodad, Untitled Goose Game, Fall Guys and countless others owe a huge debt of online stardom to these silly jump scare robots. Perhaps even Fortnite too. Maybe they'll release a skin as a thank you, or I don't know, steal a dance or something. The Last of Us Part 2 On the subject of fun games, how about these fun guys? As in, you know, like fun guys because, you know, because it's mushroom zombies. Look, either appreciate that laboured pun or we'll send Ellie round to brutally murder all your dogs, okay? So we're not sure fun is the right word for Naughty Dog's long anticipated follow-up to The Last of Us. Compelling, maybe. Harrowing. Gut-wrenching. Emotional. Incredibly graphic. But whatever it is, it is without a doubt a masterpiece of interactive storytelling. One that pushed the boundaries of uncomfortable subject matter in a provocative yet mature way. Fortunately, whatever you think about the violence, it was entertaining to play. Controls felt tighter than the 2013 original, you could go fully prone for added tension during stealth sections, and they even added control options to make the aiming a little less awkward. Indeed, The Last of Us Part 2 is one of several recent games that has really upped the ante when it comes to accessibility for gamers with certain needs, another commendable aspect of this title. The narrative excellence and stellar character work almost goes without saying, but it should be noted that this wasn't just a glorified movie. Gameplay carried just as much impact in this bleak setting. Every single encounter seems to take the brutality to new levels, whether it's the savage combat animations or the fact that every enemy has a name, so you feel that much worse when you kill Derek or Marsha or Captain Woofington. Realistically, both titles should be commended for their influence on the industry. Yes, the first game launched at the tail end of the PS3's lifespan, but both installments have neatly booked ended the PS4's lifespan, and shown us the very best that video game storytelling can offer. The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt Released in 2015, oh Jesus, has it been that long already? CD Projekt Red's third installment in the Witcher series set a new gold standard for RPGs. The world itself was visually magnificent, a combination of vivid natural landscapes and unnatural fantasy structures married together seamlessly. But below the surface hid dark secrets and tales of intrigue, magic and mystery, driven in part by the monsters and myths inspired by real-life Eastern Europe. European folklore, which is also reflected in the stellar soundtrack, by the way. Yet, despite the main storyline's classic save-the-world fantasy trappings, many quests focus in on regular people and their struggles with politics, conflict, and war. From this realism, then, came an unforgettable cast of characters, filled with nuance and driven by different motivations. Alongside our favourite cat-eyed snark peddler Geralt, we had Ciri, Triss, Yennefer, Dandelion, Vesemir… even the supposed bad guys weren't so easily defined. The Bloody Baron story arc alone was fascinating to unravel. And that's without considering the superb expansions, where amongst other things, you could go on a mushroom trip and talk to your horse, Roach. Gotta say, I expected a young mare to sound… Uh, girlish. Based on what? Your vast experience with talking animals? RPGs typically provide tens if not hundreds of hours of content, but never before has every side quest and activity felt so meaningful and rewarding. Yes, even Gwent, and no, we do not regret spending 40 plus hours on a collectible card minigame within a game. And last but not least, The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. Everyone knows what makes a Zelda game. Young boy in green whose name is not Zelda. Gadgets, maybe a musical instrument. Dungeon, dungeon, dungeon. Smash Ganon in the face. This formula for success hasn't changed in decades, thanks to Nintendo's paradoxical ability to innovate plenty while somehow making exactly the same game. 
But then 2017 rolled along, and things changed drastically. Can you spot the difference? Yeah, that's right. Link is wearing blue now! What a maverick. But that was just the tip of the Master Sword, of course. Breath of the Wild fundamentally changed what it meant to be a Zelda game. This was a true open world experience where you could go anywhere and sequence break your heart out. No blatant signposting or funneling in one direction like most Zelda titles. This felt like a throwback to the very first Legend of Zelda in 1986. Exploration, in every sense, was encouraged. Travel the stunning new landscape of Hyrule, play with the multitude of weapons and items, and experiment with all of the clever little systems at work. Use metallic weapons as a lightning rod. Make a ghetto seesaw that's definitely not playground safe. Attach octo balloons to a cart to fly gracefully through the sky. If you think it could work, chances are it did. Breath of the Wild rewarded curiosity above all else, and proved that no franchise is too old to try something new. And here we are, at the end of this list, and almost, kind of, the end of a generation. It's been an incredible eight years, and there were so many more fantastic, era-defining games we could have included that narrowly missed the mark. If you didn't quite agree with our choices, why not tell us your generation-defining games in the comments below? And please, let's be civil about this, 2020's been horrible enough. You can follow Triple Jump on Twitter here, and while you're at it, why not support the things you enjoy by having a look at our Patreon. Finally, don't forget to like the video, share it with your friends, and subscribe to the channel. I'm Peter. And I'm Ben from Triple Jump, and thanks for watching.